It is now time for question period. The member from Nepean Carlton. Thank you very much, Speaker. My question is uh, to the Premier. Each day as we sit through the Justice Committee and reread the uh, OPPITO, it becomes more clear that Premier Wynne could have either been complicit or ignorant of the alleged destruction of email documents over the $1.1 billion cancelled gas plants. Here are the undisputable facts. She co-chaired the campaign that cancelled them. As a member of the Cabinet, she signed the contract. She, can she said that the cancellation cost $40 million when it cost $1.1 billion. The global password for Peter Faced was open well into her transition, and as the OPP said, it was immediate. It was between February 6 and March 20th. Her assistant, Brianna Ames, had her computer wiped after February 11th, and Peter Feist worked for her up until the Secretary of Cabinet told us that she could have launched an internal investigation into this. Why didn't she? Is she afraid Thank of her? Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Well, again, let me let me just say, as I have said before in this House and uh, before committee, that um, I uh, I have taken responsibility for um, mistakes that were uh, that were made around the relocation of the gas plants. When I came into this job, I knew that there needed to be an opening up of the process. Uh, I asked the uh, Auditor General to look at the situation, Mr. Speaker. We opened up the scope of the committee. I have appeared before the committee twice. We have, we have put hundreds of thousands of pages of documents in front of the committee, Mr. Speaker. We've changed the rules around the retention of documents, Mr. Speaker. So we have opened up the process, and it's very clear, Mr. Speaker, that the uh, the allegations that are in uh, in front of the uh, the public at this point are about the former premier's former chief of staff, whom I did not direct and who was not Thank part you. of my staff, Mr. Speaker. It's convenient to talk about the one individual where there is an OPP ITO, but we do know other information. I listed it uh, in, a, in a chronological way and in, in an orderly manner. But the cabinet secretary appeared yesterday at the Justice Committee, and he said he and this premier spoke about passwords for the former premier's computers. He also said he spoke with uh, Manik Smith, the former uh, transition chair uh, for uh, Ms. Wynn. And given as the OPP say the transition happened immediately, she and her transition team would have noticed after they gained access to those passwords that the hard drives were white. So I ask the Premier one more time, given what we know, that you knowingly withheld information from this Assembly on the $40 million, how are we supposed Question. to believe you now, and why didn't you hold a probe into this matter? Is it because you and my Nick Smith know a little too much and you're afraid of it to come Good. out? Thank you. Much, Mr. Speaker, well, I know that the uh, government House leader will want to comment on what was or was not said at uh, committee yesterday. But, Mr. Speaker, let me just say on the issue around the passwords, and this is important. The member opposite has her facts completely wrong again, Mr. Speaker. On May 7th last year, the Justice Committee asked for all gas plant documents in the Premier's office. On May 21st, my office delivered 30,000 documents, and here is what my chief of staff wrote to the committee, which the member would have seen. Quote, I am writing on behalf of the Office of the Premier in response to the motion passed by the Standing Committee on Justice Policy Order. on May 7, 2013. On May 9, we were advised by Cabinet Office IT that the email accounts of 52 individuals formerly employed, formerly employed in the Premier's office could be accessed. A search of those accounts was conducted by my office, and any available Answer. records applicable to the Committee's motion have been included. I have enclosed with this letter a list of the 52 individuals. Individuals, unquote. Thank you. Final supplementary. The facts speak for themselves. I sat in committee. The Premier didn't. The Secretary of the Cabinet told us yesterday he spoke with the Premier about the passwords for the former Premier's office. He said he raised red flags with her transition chair, Monique Smith. One of her staff, as I indicated yesterday, had her computer wiped. Another one who did the wiping remained on payroll with the Liberal Party up until three weeks ago. Wow. No one believes the Premier on this. She said in this House it was $40 million price tag. 
It's a $1.1 billion price tag. She can sue the Leader of the Opposition. She can try to sue me, but she can't sue the truth. It will come out. So I, again, I ask her, not the third grade Herb Gray from Dollarama. I'm asking her, will you tell us why you have not decided to call an internal probe, or will you call a judicial inquiry barring that? Thank you. Thank you. Excuse me. I, uh, thank you. You're ahead of me. Now we're going to do it properly. Would the member please withdraw? And the member from Leeds, Grenville, will withdraw. Odd speaker. I, uh, I'm going to try to finish this round by indicating to you that uh, on both sides, while questions are being put, and I'll wait until I have the attention of the people who I need to hear this. I'll wait. Thank you. While the question is being put, I'm hearing heckling from one side, and when the answer is being put, I'm hearing heckling from the same side. Premier. House Leader, Mr. Speaker. House Leader. Mr. Uh, Mr. Speaker, if I, if I can begin, I just want to say that I am very, very proud to be compared to the Right Honourable Herb Gray, a man of great integrity and an outstanding public servant, Mr. Speaker, and the honourable members across the way can compare me to him any day of the week. So uncool. Mr. Speaker, let's talk about Mr. Wallace's third appearance at the Standing Committee on Justice Policy. He made a number of things clear. First, he confirmed that it was the Chief of Staff to the former Premier who requested the access codes. We confirmed that he had, had he known Mr. Livingston was serious about the request, he would have taken very different steps. He confirmed that the Public Service's response to committee document requests were done in good faith. And most importantly, Mr. Speaker, Answer. Mr. Wallace confirmed that he had not briefed Premier Wynne on the deletion or destruction of emails from there the former is. Premier's office. He confirmed Thank that he you. had not briefed Premier Wynne's transition team. Question. The member from Nipissing. Thank you and good morning, Speaker. Uh, my question is for the Premier. Last week at question period, I stood here and said, quote, many of your cabinet ministers stood in this house and said one thing about the gas plants, knowing the complete opposite to be true. Quote, you stood up and told the legislature what I said wasn't true. Well, Premier, minister after minister stood and said, you have all the documents. Well, we didn't have all the documents. Other ministers, including yourself, told us the total cost of cancellation is $40 million, but the Auditor General told us it was $1.1 billion. Premier, you're telling the legislature one thing when the complete opposite is true. We bring the facts to this House. You say they're wrong. Why are you perpetrating false allegations? Thank you. Mr. Speaker, again, I, I am not. What I am doing is I am answering the questions that have been asked of me. And when I came into this office, and the, the member opposite, all of the members opposite know this, when I came into this office, I knew, member from I knew Chatham, there come were to order. unanswered questions about the relocation of the gas plants. I knew that we needed to provide documentation in response to committee requests. That is what we have done, Mr. Speaker. Hundreds of thousands of pages of documents. Uh, the committee has had the ability to call uh, uh, dozens of people before it and ask questions and have had the answers, Mr. Speaker, from those people. So, you know, we knew the process needed to be opened up. I said during my leadership campaign that I was going to do that. I have done that, Mr. Speaker. There is now, there is now an OPP, an independent OPP investigation underway. Answer. We need to let that investigation unfold, and the committee will continue to do its work. I hope at some point the committee will be able Thank to you. write a report, Mr. Speaker. I look forward to that. Thank but you. in the meantime, they have their work. 
Thank you. Supplementary. Mr. Speaker, well, Premier, there's so many scandals, so little time. Our leader, Tim Hudak, and member from Nepi and Carleton, dig deeper into your scandal and you try to silence them. The member from Aurora has done a remarkable job of exposing your orange air ambulance scandal, and you point fingers instead of answering questions. The member from Barrie has exposed the financial scandal unfolding over the Pan Am Games. I bring the truth about our finances to the Legislature, and you accuse me. Whenever a member of the PC caucus presents more of the facts, brings the truth forward, you lash out with personal attacks and make false accusations. What are you afraid of, Premier? What are you hiding? Thank you. Mr. Speaker, well, you know, I, I actually have a profound respect for the way this House should operate, Mr. Speaker. I have a profound respect for the role of the official opposition and for the third party. And, Mr. Speaker, had I believed that there wasn't a need for more openness, then during my leadership run, Mr. Speaker, I wouldn't have proposed that we open up the process. I knew, I knew, Mr. Speaker, that there were questions being asked that needed to be answered. That that's why we opened up the process. The member from Renfrew, Nipissing, Pembroke Speaker, will come to order. It is absolutely my belief that the opposition and the third party have a very important role to play in terms of shining a light on issues that are of importance to the people of Ontario. Everybody has but every, in every case, Mr. Speaker, I believe that dealing with facts Answer. and dealing with uh, evidence, Mr. Speaker, is what their modus operandi should be. I'm interested in debate. I want there to be debate. Thank you. I want there to be healthy debate based on Thank fact. You. Be seated, please. Be seated, please. Thank you. Final supplementary. Thank you, Speaker. You continue to say we made mistakes. Mr. Well, Energy, come to order. Premier, there's no mistake. This was all done by design. The gas plant scandal documents proved you signed the go-ahead for Project Vapor. It was your signature that approved a blank check in order to reach a deal. Your signature moved the gas plant from the public court to private arbitration. This was to keep the result secret. Then you told us it was only $40 million because you buried most of the cost on the hydro Minister bill. Of Training, it took the Colleges Auditor General to show us to the extra billion dollars owed by the taxpayers. How can you continue to pretend you know nothing of the gas plant Natural cancellation when it was you and you alone who started the whole process? Uh, Thank you. You seen it, please? You seen it, please? Thank you. Premier. Again, we have to deal with facts, and the fact is, the fact is that I was part of a cabinet, Mr. Speaker. Uh, I was part of a cabinet that took collective action to implement a promise that had been made by all parties, Mr. Speaker. That's the fact. And I just, I just want to use an example. So when we talk about mistakes that were made, here's, here's a mistake that I think was made. I believe that in the initial decision around uh, relocating the gas plants, placing the gas plants where they were, and then relocating them, the community was not consulted was not taken into from account Redford, in Nipissing, the way that Pembroke, it should have been. Order, there was not a time. process that engaged community and allowed for that Answer. input, Mr. Speaker. We've changed Open the rules yeah. so that that can happen again, Mr. Speaker, so that communities would be involved. That's what I Thank mean you. by learning from uh, past experience, Mr. Thank Speaker. You. New question, the leader of the third party. Thank you, Speaker. My question is for the Premier. Yesterday, Peter Wallace, the Secretary of Cabinet, described the plan to bring in outside Liberal operatives to destroy the computer records as, quote, stupid. He told the committee that when it came to political record keeping, it was the incoming Premier's responsibility to check with her predecessor. Did the Premier ever talk to Dalton McGuinty about email deletions, computer wiping, or record keeping? And if so, what did he tell her? Thank you, Premier. Mr. Speaker, as 
the, uh, as the leader of the third party knows, the allegations on those issues that have been made were made about a, uh, a staff person, the former chief of staff of the former premier, Mr. Speaker. I learned of those allegations. I learned of the nature of those allegations at the, si at the same time that uh, that she did, Mr. Speaker. And I've been very clear that the uh, the allegations, the person against whom the allegations are laid, never worked for me. Was not part of my staff, Mr. Speaker. Speaker, when Dalton McGuinty left office, there was a blaze of publicity around hidden documents, deleted emails, and possible contempt of the legislature. It's pretty hard to imagine that there was, this wasn't a top of mind issue for pretty much everyone. Speaker, did the premier's chief of staff discuss record keeping with, in the premier's office with David Livingston? And if so, what did he learn? Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. So here was what was top of mind on this issue for me when I came into this office, Mr. Speaker, and that was how are we going to open up this process so that we can make sure that the documents that are being asked for, that the questions that are being asked are going to be answered. We talked about how do we open up the scope of the committee, Mr. Speaker. We talked about whether we should ask the uh, Auditor General to look at the situation. We did that. We opened up the scope of the committee. So That's it was top of mind, and as I've said many times today, Today and yesterday and before, Mr. Speaker, in my leadership run, I knew that we needed to open up this process. That's what I've done, Mr. Speaker. That's the commitment that I made, and that's exactly what I followed through Thank on. You. Final supplementary. Speaker, I think the Premier is trying to be a little bit deliberately obtuse here. The Premier served with Dalton McGuinty for over a decade. She was his campaign co-chair speaker. She signed off on the gas plant decisions and pledged to uphold the legacy of Dalton. Is she seriously claiming that no one on her team asked basic questions about the scandal that chased Dalton McGuinty from office? So, Mr. Speaker, the preamble to that question basically says I was part of a government and I was part of a cabinet that took action on a promise that had been made by every party in this House, Mr. Speaker. We implemented the relocation of the gas plants, which was a promise that was made by all parties. And I have said that that's the case. I was part of that cabinet, Mr. Speaker. We did act on that, Mr. Speaker, because, because the initial process of locating those gas plants yep. was not what it should have been. Nope. The community was not consulted in the way that it should have been, Mr. Speaker. There needed to be a different process. So, two things on my mind when I came into this office. We need to open up the process and make sure that the questions that are being asked about the relocation get answered. We did that. The second thing was we need to change the Answer. process going forward, and that is what we have done, Mr. Speaker. My next question the member is, from Prince Edward Hastings will come to order. My next question is also for New the question. Premier Speaker. Peter Wallace told the Standing Committee on Justice that he began talks with Manick Smith, the head of the Premier's transition Minister team, of the Environment, on come to order. January the 22nd, before David Livingston asked for a password to wipe computers in the Premier's office. He said they discussed the situation with the gas plant scandal. What steps did the Premier's trans transition team take to ensure records would actually be protected? Speaker. Premier. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Well, again, I will. I will just. I think what I will do is is quote what the uh, what the Secretary of Cabinet said yesterday at committee, um, and he was asked by the member for Bramley Gore Malton. Did you provide upda updates to anyone, not perhaps in the Premier's office, to any minister's office, or anyone affiliated with any of the ministers? Peter Wallace said, no, I did not. And, Mr. Speaker, I know that the, uh, the leader of the third party knows that uh, during the transition period, we were very engaged in getting ready for going forward with governing, Mr. Speaker. She knows that because my staff were meeting with her staff. Uh, we were working to set up the committee, as I said in uh, answer to previous questions. It was top of my mind that we open up a process that would allow the questions that were being Answer. asked to be answered. That's what we did, and Mr. Speaker, I made that commitment and followed through on it. Thank you. Supplementary. The Secretary of Cabinet told the Gas Plants Committee that one of the things he raised with Monique Smith was record retention. And I quote, so we had broad conversations around the issues in front of the legislature about document production by the public service, about the 
absence of document production by others. Now, unquote. Now, can the Premier tell us what the head of her transition team relayed to her about this conversation? Well, Mr. Speaker, and I know that the, the government House leader is going to want to speak to uh, the committee process yesterday, but um, just let me say this, that uh, the leader of the third party knows that uh, we have changed the rules around document retention in my office, Mr. Speaker. We have trained, we have trained uh, the uh, staff, Mr. Speaker, to know what to retain and what not to retain. So again, Mr. Speaker, uh, it was very much my concern that we put in place the structures and the rules to make sure that uh, that this situation did not arise again, whether it was the uh, the initial situation of the location of the gas plants, Mr. Speaker, or the way documentation was dealt with. We've, we changed the rules. We've made it clear what those rules are, Mr. Speaker, and in the process of doing that, have provided the information Answer. that has been asked for by the committee. Thank you. Final supplementary. Speaker, the Premier continues to claim that she's as surprised as anyone by the allegations, investigations, and wasted billion dollars. But the people stuck paying the bill, Speaker, for this mess know that she's not just an average citizen. She sat at the cabinet table. She headed up the campaign team. She signed off on the gas plant cancellations. And she and her team were briefed on what was going on, Speaker. Why won't the Premier simply tell us what she was told and when? And Mr. Speaker, that member was a leader of the party that made the exact same promise going into the last election and fails to provide us with the costing and the work that she did. But let's talk about Mr. Wallace yesterday. What Mr. Wallace said in front of the committee, two important points, Mr. Speaker. In terms of his discussions with the transition team, and I quote, we did not express any advice with respect to the management of political records or the hard drives or the emails associated with the former Premier's office. That was his discussion with the transition team. But what is equally important, Mr. Speaker, is that Mr. Wallace, in his testimony, spoke about the commitment of the current Premier to make sure that necessary documents, documents that had been requested, would be provided to the appropriate legislative committees, and that she made openness part of her hallmark as she became Answer. Premier. Another important point that Mr. Wallace made yesterday. The new question, the member from Lampton, Kate Middlesex. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. My question this morning is to the Premier. Premier, following up on my questions from yesterday about possible illegal Liberal donations, the Toronto Sun has reportedly been speaking with Mr. Barry about what you said was a, quote, clerical error since October. During this time, no adjustments have been made in the official records at Elections Ontario, and none of the seven Liberal entities, including your Chief of Staff, or your Minister for Community Safety and Corrections have returned any of the nearly $11,000 in potentially illegal donations. Premier, a true clerical error does not occur multiple times over multiple years and does not occur in donations totaling nearly $11,000. Premier, was it because James Barry was illegally Question. funneling money to your Liberal Party that you decided to reward him with an appointment to the Board of Governors for the College of Trades, or was there another Thank reason? Thank you. Stop the clock, please. Be seated, please. Be seated, please. Thank you. Premier. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And I don't think the answer changes from yesterday, Mr. No, Speaker. So. The, the rules surrounding politi political donations are obviously a very important part of the democratic process. We need to make sure that those rules are in place. Um, the, uh, my understanding is that Elections Ontario has been asked to look at uh, some questions about some particular donations. Um, my understanding is that that, uh, that process is ongoing. And of course, we'll work with Elections Ontario if, uh, if they have any questions. That uh, that is what I said yesterday, Mr. Speaker, and it, uh, it stands today. We will work with Elections Ontario as they undergo this investigation. Thank you. Supplementary. You can spin this uh, all you like, but the facts remain. Seven Liberal entities, including your Chief of Staff and your Minister of Community Safety and Correctional Services, have accepted nearly $11,000 in potentially illegal donations violating the Elections Finances Act. Premier, this is not a clerical error. 
James Berry is a key public figure and heads the IBEW, a key donor to both the Liberal Party and the largest single donor to the Working Families Coalition. Wow. This organization has top-notch legal advice and has a sound understanding of Ontario election law because, as you know, they use its loopholes to fund the Ontario Liberal Party. Premier, is it because James Berry's IBEW is funding the Working Families Coalition that you have refused to take the necessary steps to remove him from the Board of Governors at the Ontario College of Trades, or are you protecting him for yet another reason? Thank you. Mr. Speaker, all we have here is, is a complaint was made to Elections Ontario. Elections Ontario is looking into the complaint. The person in the organization that Elections Ontario is looking into has said that there was a clerical error. The member refers to that as something else because he obviously has more information than he's telling us because Elections Ontario is looking into this matter right now. I think we have to also correct the fact, because he should know better than this, uh, James Berry is not a political appointment, Mr. Speaker. Those appointments are made by the Appointments Council of the Ontario College of Trades. They appoint him to the position on the Board of Governors there. It's not a government appointment whatsoever. So, Mr. Speaker, I suggest when the member gets up to slur other people's reputation that he... Thank you. Stop the, clock. The, the member from uh, Simcoe North will come to order. New question. The member from Bramley, Gore, Malton. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Premier. Every time there seemed there was a chance to get answers, the Premier seemed to be looking the other way. She claimed she didn't learn about the allegations of computer wiping until March 27th, even though members of her staff had their computers wiped a year and a half ago. She never asked the Secretary of Cabinet for a briefing on email deletions. She claims she's never seen the report the, uh, on the internal government Minister investigation of the into computer wiping. Time, the Minister for Rural Affairs, this raises the question, time. Mr. Speaker. Is the Premier more interested in getting answers or advancing her own deniability? Thank you. The Minister of uh, Government House Leader, sorry. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Uh, you know, I, I thank the member for, for his question. He's pointing out exactly what we're saying over here, that, uh, that it was a former member of the former Premier staff, Mr. Livingston, who is the topic of uh, the investigation by the Ontario Provincial Police, oh, and that uh, the current Premier was not involved. I'll remind him of his words yesterday in front of the committee. This is what the member said. In making your decision, this was to Mr. Wallace about the, uh, his interactions with Mr. Livingston, were there any points in time where you had contact with or you provided updates to information to anyone in the current Premier's office? Mr. Wallace. No. no. Did you provide Enough. updates to anyone, not perhaps in the Premier's office, to any Minister's office, or anyone affiliated with any of the Minister's office? Mr. Wallace, no, I did not. Mr. Speaker, Answer. this is a police investigation about Mr. Livingston. These are serious accusations. They are unfounded. We should allow the OPP thank you. to do their work. Thank you. Supplementary. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Well, that's exactly the problem, Mr. Speaker. That's exactly the problem. Getting answers in a $1.1 billion scandal means asking the tough questions. The Premier claims she wanted to fix the problem that led to the, the actions that the Secretary of Cabinet called potentially criminally stupid. How does a Premier expect to fix the problems if she won't ask the tough questions how one, the $1.1 billion were wasted and how key information was destroyed? Let's go right back to the beginning. There were 21 gas plants that were cited in the province of Ontario. Two of them were done in error. There were mistakes made about where they were cited. Every single party in this House said it was a mistake and that they would cancel those were they elected in government. Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Mr. Speaker, it was this Premier who opened up the process, 
who helped facilitate the member from the Stormont, Dundas, and South Bend, Gary, come to order. Legislative committees, who, and I can tell you as House Leader, I received direction that we have a broad as committee as possible with broad powers and scope, Mr. Speaker. And it has been this Premier who has been looking forward and finding out ways that these types of mistakes will not happen again Answer. so that the proper siting of power plants happens in the future. Oh, you a new question, the member from Glengarry, Prescott, Russell. Thank you very much, Speaker. My question is to the Minister of Community Safety and Correctional Services. Speaker, I think everyone in this House would agree that it's been a very long winter, but sun is shining and spring has actually arrived. And that means several small and rural municipalities across Ontario from Chatham, come need to, to order. watch for potential flooding caused by rapidly melting snow and or heavy rainfall. Just last Thursday in eastern Ontario, the city of Belleville declared a state of emergency due, due to high water levels. And just yesterday, the municipality of Centre Hastings and the municipality of Tweed also declared states of emergency. Speaker, can the minister tell the House on the current situation in Belleville and in the municipalities of Centre Hastings and Tweed, including the efforts that are underway to assist these communities? Thank you. Minister of Community and Safety. Community safety and corrections. Thank you very much, Speaker. And I thank the member for the question. Speaker, indeed, the flood season is upon us, and the Office of the Fire Marshal and the Emergency Management is ready to respond to any potential emergency and pre pre prepare to provide assistance when it is needed. Uh, the Office, uh, Speaker, has been in contact with affected and potentially affected communities. Speaker, unfortunately, as the member mentioned, we all know Belleville has been hit ha hard with the high water level since last week. Due to the spring melt and precipitation, the Moira River has overflowed, affecting approximately 70 homes uh, thus far. Uh, speaker, I want to take this opportunity to commend the people of, uh, of uh, Belleville. So far, they've handled this uh, situation locally, uh, bringing forward over 500 volunteers to sandbag affected homes. This demonstrates determination, Answer. compassion, and resilience. Speaker, both Centre Hastings and Tweed have both declared emergency on a precautionary basis as well. The emergency management of field officer has been in touch with these communities, and we are working uh, with them to uh, to offer any assistance and advice that we can provide as a, as a ministry. Supplementary. Thank you very much, Speaker, and thank you, Minister, for the update. It's good to know that the Office of the Fire Marshal and Emergency Management is prepared to respond to any emergency and able to assist when needed. Like Belleville, Centre Hastings and Tweed, many communities across Ontario, unfortunately, may face the exact same situation. Rapid flooding can cause severe property damage and threaten the lives of several Ontarians. To avoid risk, it's always best to be prepared and be ready to act when facing a situation like this. Speaker, once again, can the minister tell us what information is important to share with those living in communities across our ridings and how they need to prepare ahead of a potential spring flooding season? Question. Thank you, Minister. Thank, thank you very much, uh, uh, Speaker. And I, I want to assure the member and all members that uh, we will continue to, of course, work with local communities to ensure that they have all the assistance they need. I've had the opportunity yesterday to speak from the member from Prince Ed Edward Hastings as well, and I gave him my personal assurance uh, that uh, we will be there working along with him and his community to make sure uh, that the communities are perfect, uh, protected and they have the assistance they need. Speaker, uh, we all have a personal responsibility when it comes to making sure that we are prepared for these type of uh, emergencies. Uh, uh, we expect it to prepare, prepare to take care of ourselves and our families for a minimum of 72 hours. Uh, spe uh, speaker, being prepared Answer. is a three-step process. Make a plan, build an emergency kit, and be informed. I encourage everybody to go to emergencymanagementontario.ca for more information. Thank, Thank you. you. No questions? The member from here on Bruce. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Minister of Energy. Earlier this week, renewable energy approval was issued for Jericho Wind Incorporated, a project owned by Nextera Canada, clearing the way for building 92 new turbines in the municipality of Lambton Shores. But this isn't the only new approval. Over and above that, in February, an ERT dismissed the appeal of the Kerwood Wind Inc. project, approving 37 new turbines in the county of Middlesex. Also in February, another ERT dismissed an appeal of the K2 Wind project in Huron County, approving 140 turbines. Oh, this is happening at the same time as European jurisdictions are abandoning wind projects yep. because they don't work. Ontario does not need Mr. to power without minister. portfolio. Sorry, will come costs of electricity are making living in Ontario unaffordable. Minister, in light of all this, Question. why do you keep approving new turbines? Why? <laughs> 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 
Minister of Energy. Mr. Speaker, I appreciate the question from Huron Bruce, but uh, her information uh, tends to be somewhat inaccurate. These are existing contracts, Mr. Speaker. These are existing contracts which have been awarded to proponents, and she is suggesting that we ought to have cancelled those projects. She is suggesting that we cancel them all, the same as one of her other colleagues well, suggested. At the risk, Mr. Speaker, of $20 billion. Carry on, please. Mr. The Minister, or, uh, Speaker, they say we shouldn't. Just as soon as I get quiet, someone decides to it. Now he's warned. The member from Renfrew, Nipissing, Pembroke. Again. Speaker, the member is basically saying we should cancel existing contracts. Cancel contracts? Have you heard that word before over there? Member from Mr. Huron, Speaker, Bruce, come to order. We have, we have examined the proposal. The member from Prince Edward Hastings will withdraw. I will withdraw. The member from Leeds Grenville will come to order. The member from Lambton Kent Middlesex will come to order. The member from Huron Bruce will come to order. And the member from Northumberland Quinty West will come to order. Finish, please. The Leader of the Opposition introduced a bill which would give the Minister of Energy, under his government, the right to cancel 255 renewable Thank you. contracts. Thank you. Supplementary. Minister, your Liberal government cancelled two gas plants to save seats in the last election. Well, anyway. But you refused to listen to the people of Ontario leader, come to order. wind energy. You refused to listen to the facts. Yep. You refused to follow the lead of other jurisdictions around the world that are abandoning expensive wind projects. Uh, Minister, Minister Transportation, when will come you to do order. the right thing? and implement an immediate moratorium on industrial wind yeah, yeah. turbines. When are you going to do this? Thank you. Minister of Energy. Mr. Speaker, the, From Chatham, second the opposition time. party, through various members, including the leader, continue to suggest not only suggest, but introduce legislation that would give the minister the authority to cancel existing contracts. The member from Prince Edward Hastings is warned. Finish, please. Mr. Speaker, out of respect for the opposition, I decline to say anything else. Thank you. New question, the member from Nickelbelt. I have a question for the Minister of Health. The minister implied that she had no role to play in addressing the overprescribing of antipsychotic drugs to seniors in her long-term care homes. It was not herself, but physician, who did the prescribing. She said this in spite of a 2007 report from the Auditor Gen General directing her ministry to address this issue, and in spite of evidence that the province and the government needs to do a better job caring for people with dementia. My question is simple. Does the minister still think that the problem lies solely with our physicians? Well, Speaker, um, I'm happy to have the opportunity to clarify that, uh, in fact, that is not what I said, and I would happily share the transcripts from the scrum that indicated we are all in this together. We all have a role to play. Long-term care homes are where our loved ones, many of our lo loved ones, end their lives. We want the very, very best care for them. And, Speaker, we really are making progress when it comes to providing non pharmaceutical um, care for people, particularly through Behaviour Supports Ontario. And I've got, I'd be happy to talk more about that. We've also established three uh, centres of learning and innovation, one at Briere in Ottawa, one at Schlegel in Kitchener-Waterloo, and uh, one here at Baycrest in Toronto, where, where various research projects are underway, one of them specifically dealing with the appropriate use of, uh, of pharmaceuticals Thank when you. it comes to behaviour. Thank you, Speaker. Well, the reality is that the use of antipsychotic as chemical restraint is not because physicians don't know better. It is because of systemic problems. The minister is in charge of our health care system. Therefore, she is the one in charge of fixing the problem, not failing our seniors. It is deeply concerning that the minister would rather point fingers than take a leadership role 
and face this growing crisis. Can the minister tell Ontarian what is it going to take? Or, as some people say it, how many people will need to die before she accepts responsibility for his, this issue and take a leadership role? Thank you, Minister. Well, uh, Speaker, I accept full responsibility, and we collectively are working within the health care system to deal with this issue. Let me give you a couple of examples of uh, behavioral supports Ontario having demonstrated results. In one home, uh, behavioral incidents have dropped by 75 per cent. A decrease of 90 to 95 per cent in physical injuries to staff due to, due to Behavioural Supports Ontario. One resident would start screaming loudly and randomly throughout the day, which was very distressing for him, for residents, for staff. The BSO team, through behaviour mapping, identified that he really liked cheesies and coke, but he wasn't able to verbalize that that's what he wanted before he got angry. So anytime he got agitated, they now offer him cheesies and coke. His outbreaks have been virtually eliminated Answer. Speaker, through non-drugs. There are many, many success stories that do not involve those drugs, Speaker, and we are working to bring those throughout the health care system. Thank you, Speaker. Speaker, to live in Mississauga is to spend a lot of time on the road in one's cars, and that's why it's not surprising that— Oh, sorry, my question is to— the Minister of Consumer Services. Speaker, to live in Mississauga is to spend a lot of time in one's cars, and I get my share of complaints from constituents from everything about potholes to auto insurance to tow truck issues. Therefore, Minister, I was happy to hear that you have tabled new legislation to bring greater consumer protection to drivers in Ontario by addressing some of the many concerns that have been raised over the years with regard to towing services. And as it has been pointed out in the past, this sector also plays a role in perpetuating auto fraud, which leads Question. to higher insurance rates. So, Minister, can you please share with the House how this legislation is going to help my constituents? Thank you. Thank you. And, uh, Speaker, I'd also like to thank the member for Mississauga Cooksville for this great question. Tons of discussion about this item yesterday and today in the media. We have 9 million licensed drivers in Ontario who are concerned about insurance rate speakers, and the member is quite right that stating, stating that fraud in the auto insurance industry is one of the reasons for high insurance rates for drivers in Ontario. Our Bill 189, the Roadside Assistance uh, Protection Act, intends to address concerns that towing operators contribute to inflation rates. Inflation of rates. There are stories of unscrupulous operators taking advantage of stranded drivers. Story, stories of steering claimants to particular storage and body shop uh, organizations, and stories of motor motorist vehicles being towed to a location 20, 30, or even 50 kilometers away. Drivers yes, involved in traffic collisions or in need of roadside assistance should feel confident that the tow truck operator will be treating them fairly, and Thank that you. is what our legislation will do. Thank you. Supplementary. Thank you, Minister, for that answer. And speaker, um, as a member with one of the major 400 series highway running through my riding, I hear on a repeated basis concerns and issues with tow trucks and their operators on our highways. Specifically, what happens when a car is being towed and after it has been towed? That's why I was pleased to hear that there will now be specific legislation to address the issues that my residents and others have raised. It's really important to ensure drivers are aware of their rights and that they know what to expect when their vehicle is being towed, as it is a moment of vulnerability, especially if it is after an accident. Unfortunately, this moment of vulnerability is also an opportunity for those with unscrewed scrupulous intentions to take advantage of stranded drivers. Minister, can you please share how Bill 89 will ensure drivers and operators are better protected? Thank you. Uh, speaker, there are about 1,200 towing operators in Ontario and 3,000 uh, tow truck drivers, and most of them provide good service. They keep our roads free and clear by removing vehicles, including those involved in collisions, and they do it in a timely manner. However, there are concerns, Speaker, and Bill 189 tends, uh, intends to bring clarity and accountability to the towing industry so Ontario drivers are better protected and are safer on our roads. This legislation, if passed, would do numerous things. 
First is amend the Highway Traffic Act to require all tow truck drivers in Ontario to register under the Ministry of Transport's um, Commercial Vehicle Operators Registration System. They're currently not registered. The legislation would also require disclosure and uh, uh, the, the tow truck drivers to obtain approval from consumers before charging for towing and storage and services. Sir? Prices have to be posted, itemized invoices, alternative payments, not just cash, would be uh, uh, required, and access to towed vehicle contents. Thank you. This will strengthen consumer protection in Ontario. Thank you. Thank you. New question, the member from Bruce Gray, one South. Here, here. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question to you is to the Premier. On March 6, I hand delivered a letter to you and your ministers of infrastructure, as well as economic development, trade and employment, and training colleges and universities, asking all of you to review a proposal by Georgian College to invest in the relocation of the Marine Emergency Duties Training Program to the Owen Sound campus. This investment would be a key source of jobs for the communities and region that depend on the marine industry. Premier, will you invest in the education sector, in jobs, and in rural Ontario, and commit to providing funding to this valuable program? Premier. Minister of Training, Colleges and Universities. Training, Colleges and Universities. Yeah, I was speaking to one of his colleagues when he started the question, but I heard the last part of it. And, Mr. Speaker, the investments that we've made in, in post-secondary education in rural Ontario and urban Ontario are un unprecedented, Mr. Speaker. Uh, we've been there for, uh, for our post-secondary students. Uh, we've been there for our post-secondary students in the north. Uh, when you look at the program expansions we've seen and the work we've done with, with, with universities like Lakehead and Laurentian and Sorry. others. Mr. Speaker, when you look at the work we've done with our colleges in terms it. of outreach, when we look at some of the outreach that those institutions are doing throughout rural Ontario to encourage young people to get access to post-secondary education, it's not by accident we've increased access to post-secondary education yes, by 161,000 students. I'll say more about that in the supplementary, Mr. Here, Speaker. Here. Supplementary. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question will again go back to the Premier, but sadly none of the four had the time to actually respond to me, and I was talking about the Owen Sound campus. Premier, in your BLT leak budget, it suggests you are prepared to provide 3.5 million public dollars to a private firm called Cisco, yet you have given no such support to a public institution that is Georgian College. Premier, if this particular training program does not receive your help to move to Owen Sound, there is widespread concern you will in fact drive the marine industry out of Ontario to the east and west coasts. It's a fact. The relocation of the Marine Emergency Duties Training Centre and program to the Owen Sound campus is a no-brainer and will ensure jobs remain in Ontario as well as a future campus in Owen Sound. So, Premier, once again, will you commit to supporting what's in the public interest and invest in moving the Marine Emergency Duties Training Program to Georgian College in Owen Sound? Minister. Mr. Speaker, the responsibility for determining uh, course offerings and program offerings for students across this province comes from our colleges and universities. And Mr. Speaker, no government has done better than we have in terms of meeting that demand. That's why we've seen 161,000 new students gain access to our post-secondary system right across this province. You know that's the largest increase in students in any 10-year period in the history of this province, including when Bill Davis set up the college programs. So, Mr. Speaker, we'll continue to work with our post-secondary pro uh, partners as they bring forward ideas in terms of better meeting the needs of our students and better meeting the needs of our, of our economy. We're working towards differentiation within our, our post-secondary system, which is a first Answer. to ensure we can do an even better job at doing that. But he's going to have to do his work with uh, Georgian College, and Georgian College will then, will then approach us with course offering Thank you. Uh, proposals. Thank you. New question. The leader of the third party. Uh, speaker, North, uh, sorry, my question is for the Premier. Northerners, like all Ontarians, will be paying through the nose for the Liberal $1.1 billion gas plant scandal, but to add insult to injury, a government that reneged on a promise to convert the Thunder Bay Generating Station to natural gas is now refusing to allocate sufficient biomass supply to enable the plant to provide the energy the Thunder Bay needs. Does the government have any plan whatsoever to ensure that Thunder Bay residents and Mr. Municipal Affairs and Housing, energy. come to order, please. Take credit clean aid, Speaker. Please. Minister of Energy. Sir of Energy. Mr. Speaker, we've heard this question about 15 times. Mr. Speaker, about two weeks ago, three weeks ago, we arranged a meeting with the uh, 
uh, with the uh, Ontario Power Authority uh, and other uh, people from the well, provincial government, Mr. Question. Speaker, with all of the members of the committee who wanted to come. Mr. Speaker, they got answers to all their questions. They went away reasonably satisfied. They agreed to have an additional meeting. Mr. Speaker, I want to read a quote from Scott Travers, president of the Society of Engineer Professionals. This is great news for Northern Ontarians ah. and demonstrates the foresight of the wind government. Yes. The biomass conversion will save jobs and provide clean energy. In the longer term, it also means that Ontario will be able to see the benefits of its mineral wealth to development of the Ring of Fire. Mr. Speaker, it was the right decision. Yes, it's the right decision today, and I think the member of the third party, the uh, the leader of the third party should get her facts straight. Thank you. Minister. Uh, Minister, I stand, you sit. Supplementary. Speaker, experts have criticized the recent government announcement for a partial biomass conversion of the Thunder Bay generating station. They say that the biomass, su the biomass supply approved so far is too small to supply the energy required by Northwestern Ontario, even in the short term, never mind the energy needs flowing from future mining developments. Why was the government willing to waste $1.1 billion to hold on to their political power instead of the power needs of Northwestern Ontario? Mr. Speaker, I've been wait, working very closely with my colleagues from Thunder Bay, both ministers, Morrill and Gravel. We have arranged meetings with the, with the committee, the Ontario Power Authority and the Independent Electricity System Operator, Mr. Speaker. They had all the technical people in the room, all the technical information indicated it was the right decision. It's very doable, Mr. Speaker. And on top of it, Mr. Speaker, Thunder Bay is the last coal generation in the province of Ontario. Uh, thank you. Your question, the member from Oak Ridges, Martin. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question through you is to the Minister of Rural Affairs. Minister, Ontario's small and rural communities have many unique and diverse challenges when it comes to economic development and small business growth. Places like Schaumburg, Nobleton and Van Dorf in my great riding of Oak Ridges, Markham. There are currently a number of programs designed to assist rural municipalities with these challenges, including the Southwestern Ontario Development Fund and Eastern Ontario Development Fund. One program that was very popular in my community was the Rural Economic Development Program. We cannot stand by and do nothing while other jurisdictions are competing for jobs. We need to give our local municipalities funding to help them grow their local economy. Mr. Speaker, through you to the Minister of Rural Affairs, what action are you taking to support our rural Question. Communities? Thank you. Minister of Rural Affairs. Well, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker. And I want to thank my colleague and hardworking member uh, from Oak Ridges, Markham, for a question this morning. And a short time ago, I had the opportunity to uh, uh, be with her to uh, tour the uh, Markham Fair, it just seems like a few months ago, uh, to take a look at what's going on in that wonderful community. And, Mr. Speaker, ensuring that rural communities are able to attract good jobs and grow is the top priority for me and my ministry. You know, the Rural Economic Development Program is paying great dividends. Since 2003, We've invested more than $167 million in 468 rent projects, creating more than $1.2 billion in economic activity and, more importantly, creating more than 35,000 good-paying jobs in rural Ontario. Mr. Speaker, the rent program supports high-value, low-cost projects that are the foundation of building good jobs and prosperity in rural Ontario. Thank you. They show off innovation. Thank you. Great program. Yes, you better sit down. Supplementary. Speaker, and thank you, Minister, for your response. The Rural Economic Development Program has a strong record of job creation and economic growth, and one that many municipalities are familiar with, including those in my riding. 
I know the Rural Economic Development Funding has enabled an innovative partnership between four companies in Woodbridge and Markham that have strong roots in rural Ontario. But, Mr. Speaker, recently we have heard criticisms from across the floor on rural economic development application guidelines. Through you to the Minister of Rural Affairs, could the Minister please clarify how rural economic development program guidelines benefit rural Ontario? Thank you, Minister. Well, thanks very much, Mr. Speaker. I want to thank the member for her supplementary question. You know, Mr. Speaker, I always believe that you stand on the shoulders of others. So when I became the Minister of Rural Affairs, I looked at the great work that was done by the, the member from Oxford uh, when he was the Minister of Agriculture, Food and Rural Affairs. So I simply that. followed his guidelines in Ernie terms of the that. RET program uh, wow, to make Ernie. sure that the eligibility that he established would be applied through the RET programs. And I know when the wonderful member from Oxford was the minister, he provided RET funding to the City of London, the City of Ottawa, the City of Hamilton, the City of, Car of Cornwall, and the City of Toronto. And he did so because those were agricultural entities in those communities that were buying products from their surrounding rural areas. It was a good decision Answer. back then, it's a good decision today, and we'll keep investing in rural Ontario, Mr. Speaker. New question. From yes, uh, thank you, Speaker. Uh, my question is to the Minister of Community Safety and Correctional Services. Minister, in my hand, I'm holding a letter from the Ontario Provincial Firefighters Association that threatens its members with a loss of benefits if they volunteer as a firefighter in another municipality. The letter ignores the vital role that double hatters play in providing leadership, training, and expertise to volunteer forces serving in rural communities. Instead, of, instead, it narrowly focuses on the Provincial Union's constitution, which can be used to dismiss and punish full-time firefighters who dare to volunteer where they're needed the most. Minister, do you have a plan in place to ensure rural municipalities can keep double hatters volunteering in their communities, or will you just continue Question. to stand by and watch more firefighters walk off the job? Well, thank you very much, Speaker, and I appreciate the question. And uh, I give my uh, my word to the the member opposite that I look forward to working with him on, on the issue that he's raising. I've not seen the letter that that he's referring to, but Speaker, I can really I can say this with with, with definite confidence that uh, we uh, on this side of of the of the house, and I'm sure all members uh, respect the work that firefighters do every single day, Speaker. Uh, you know. In my role as the, the Minister of Labour and now in my current role as the Minister of Community Safety and Correctional Services, I've had uh, uh, ample opportunity to spend time uh, with our firefighters to appreciate and be it professional firefighters or volunteer firefighters, Speaker, to appreciate the work they do day in and day out. When, when there is a fire in our community, as we all rushing out, they're the one who are rushing in in, in that, uh, in that kind of circumstances, saving lives every single day. And we salute them and we thank them for the work they do, Speaker. Thank you, Supplementary. Again, to the minister, I'll uh, send the letter uh, with the page over for your uh, viewing. Minister, as you know, the safety of rural communities in Waterloo Region has already been thrown into jeopardy as a result of the provincial union's intimidation tactics. Yep. In fact, three double hatters have already handed in their resignation letters in the Waterloo Region, and more are shame? on the way. Minister. I hope you can understand why this is a major issue of public safety. Double hatters play a vital role in providing the leadership needed to keep rural communities safe. So, Minister, will you step up to the plate and present a plan to keep double hatters volunteering where they're needed the most, or will you do what the Liberal Party always does and turn your back on rural Ontario once again? Again. Be seated, please. Thank you, Minister. Uh, speaker, I, with all due respect to the, the member opposite, the, the safety of our communities and the safety of our firefighters is not an issue between rural Ontario or urban Ontario. It's not an issue between the Conservative Party or the Liberal Party. Speaker, that is an issue about making sure that members of our community are safe every single day. So, Speaker, I will not debate the debate here. 
by getting into these cleavages, artificial cleavages that have been created by the party opposite, that this is somehow an assault on rural Ontario. Speaker, on this side of the House, we'll continue to work hard to make sure that members of all communities across the province, as one Ontario, are protected every single day and work with our firefighters to make that happen. Speaker. Be seated, please. Thank you. New question, the member from Nickelbelt. Merci, Monsieur le Président. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Prime Minister. April 1st has come and gone. That's the day the horse racing partnership plan was supposed to kick in, striking five years agreement for the continuation of horse racing in Ontario. Despite this deadline, Sudbury Down, the only track in Northern Ontario, still does not have an agreement, leaving the track owners, the trainers, the groomers, the vets, the farmer, and everybody else who works at or around Sudbury Down in limbo. Families are at risk of having to sell their farms, and employees do not know if they have a job. When will the Premier deliver on the promise that she made a year ago in Shin. Sudbury to the people of Sudbury that she wants a vibrant horse racing industry in Sudbury. Much, Mr. Speaker, well, I know that the uh, the member opposite, uh, if she is following this issue, she knows that the negotiations are ongoing, Mr. Speaker. She knows that we actually have put horse racing on a sustainable path forward, Mr. Speaker. And I, uh, you know, it it really um, it surprises me that the uh, that the third party would think that returning to a, a, a process that was not transparent, that was not accountable, uh, that that would be the uh, the right direction to go. We're not going to go there, Mr. Speaker. We have committed $500 million over the next five years to make sure that uh, horse racing around the province has a future. There are ongoing negotiations, and my uh, my expectation is that we will have good news yes, and that we will have uh, we will have racing at all of the tracks in the province, Mr. Yeah. Speaker. Thank you. Supplementary question. Those words are becoming harder and harder to believe. There is no agreement, and the racing season is supposed to start in a couple of weeks. Horses don't just happen in Northern Ontario. They have to know that they have a future. The future of Sudbury Down, the livelihood of the people who depend on it, all of this is still up in the air a couple of weeks before racing is supposed to start. Why? because the government is missing the deadline that they announced a year ago. Business needs stability to operate. Horse racing family need to know that they have a future. Right now, what we have is a self-fulfilling prophecy that if you leave them in limbo long enough, they will all leave the area. There won't be horses to race in Sudbury Down because you will have Question. waited too long. Will the Premier act because it is before it is too late to strike an agreement with Sudbury Down, the only track in Northern Thank Ontario. You. Mr. Speaker, the premise of that question is ridiculous. The, lead, the member opposite knows that Sudbury Downs is a summer meet track and that the dates would not be announced until later in April. But that, that's the expectation year over year. So the, the, lead, the member opposite, no, the member of the third party knows that the negotiations are ongoing. You know, I, I believe that uh, she's taking advantage of this moment because the agreement hasn't been signed, it hasn't been finalized, to ask this question. But she knows full well that the negotiations are underway. She knows oh, so that the, the, the race dates the would not be announced until later in April. We look forward to that. And it won't be, Mr. Speaker, that agreement won't be in place because of the questions she's asked. The agreement will be in place because of the process that we've put in place, because of the money that we are, we are investing in the horse racing industry and the, the, the commitment that I made to have a sustainable horse racing industry in the province, and that's what we are going to have. Thank you. We have with us in the gallery the member from Cambridge for the 36th, 37th, 38th, 39th Parliament in the Members West Gallery, Mr. Jerry Martin Young.
I suspect that the uh, member from Cambridge's point of order was not a point of order, but to steal the Speaker's thunder. So I, I, I stole it from you. Pursuant to Standing Order 38A, the member for Huron Bruce has given notice of her dissatisfaction with the answer to her question given given by the Minister of Energy concerning approvals of wind projects. This matter will be debated on Tuesday, April the 29th at 6 p.m. We have a deferred vote on the motion by Mr. Malloy that the question now be put on the motion for second reading of Bill 83. Call in the members. This will be a five-minute bill.
Would all members take their seats, please? All members take their seats, please. Thank you. Mr. Malloy has moved that the question be now put. All those in favour, please rise one at a time. Be recognized by the clerk. Mr. Malloy. Mr. Malloy. Mr. Bradley. Mr. Bradley. Mr. Shirelli. Mr. Shirelli. Madame Mayor. Madame Mayor. Mr. Souza. Mr. Souza. Ms. Wynn. Ms. Wynn. Ms. Matthews. Ms. Matthews. Mr. Nackby. Mr. Nackby. Ms. Sandals. Ms. Sandals. Mr. Hoskins. Mr. Hoskins. Ms. McCharles. Ms. McCharles. Mr. Quinter. Mr. Quinter. Mr. Bartolucci. Mr. Bartolucci. Mr. Bartolucci. Mr. Bartolucci. Mr. Cole. Mr. Cole. Mrs. Cansfield. Mrs. Cansfield. Mr. Dillon. Mr. Dillon. Mr. Duguid. Mr. Duguid. Mr. Gravel. Mr. Gravel. Mr. McMeekin. Mr. McMeekin. Ms. Peruzza. Ms. Peruzza. Mr. Murray. Mr. Murray. Mr. Morrow. Mr. Morrow. Mr. Leo. Mr. Leal. Mr. Garretson. Mr. Garretson. Mr. Delaney. Mr. Delaney. Mr. McNeely. Mr. McNeely. Mr. Quadri. Mr. Quadri. Ms. Albanese. Ms. Albanese. Mr. Orzetti. Mr. Orzetti. Mr. Coteau. Mr. Coteau. Mr. Sergio. Mr. Sergio. Mr. Flynn. Mr. Flynn. Mr. Zimmer. Mr. Zimmer. Mr. Balkas. Mr. Balkasson. Mr. Dixon. Mr. Dixon. Ms. Jassick. Ms. Jassick. Ms. Manga. Ms. Manga. Ms. Hunter. Ms. Hunter. Mr. Fraser. Mr. Fraser. Ms. Wong. Ms. Wong. Ms. Domerla. Ms. Domerla. Mr. Crack. Mr. Crack. This should be sung. Should be sung. Ms. Horvath. Ms. Horvath. Ms. Denovo. Ms. Denovo. Mr. Marchese. Mr. Marchese. Madame Jolina. Madame Jolina. Mr. Prue. Mr. Prue. Ms. Taylor. Ms. Taylor. Mr. Nadisha. Mr. Nadisha. Mr. Tabin. Mr. Tabin. Mr. Singh. Mr. Singh. Ms. Fife. Ms. Fife. Ms. Forrester. Ms. Forrester. Ms. Campbell. Ms. Campbell. Mr. Vantal. Mr. Vantal. Ms. Armstrong. Ms. Armstrong. Mr. Miller Hamilton East Stony Creek. Mr. Miller Hamilton East Stony Creek. Mr. Gates. Mr. Gates. Ms. Satton. Ms. Satton. Mr. Hatfield. Mr. Hatfield. All those opposed, please rise one at a time and be recognized by the clerk. Mr. Wilson. Mr. Wilson. Mr. Arna. Mr. Arna. Mr. Hardiman. Mr. Hardiman. Mr. Yakabuski. Mr. Yakabuski. Mr. Cleese. Mr. Cleese. Mr. Barrett. Mr. Barrett. Mr. McNaughton. Mr. McNaughton. Mr. Dunlop. Mr. Dunlop. Ms. Jones. Ms. Jones. Mrs. Monroe. Mrs. Monroe. Mr. Chudley. Mr. Chudley. Mr. Clark. Mr. Clark. Mr. Bailey. Mr. Bailey. Mr. Nichols. Mr. Nichols. Mr. Jackson. Mr. Jackson. Mr. Smith. Mr. Smith. Mr. Harris. Mr. Harris. Mr. Thompson. Mr. Thompson. Mr. Yurek. Mr. Yurek. Mr. Scott. Mr. Scott. Mrs. McKenna. Mrs. McKenna. Mr. Walker. Mr. Walker. Mr. Leone. Mr. Leone. Mr. McDonnell. Mr. McDonnell. Mr. Hilliard. Mr. Hilliard. Mr. Pettipes. Mr. Pettipes. Mr. Milligan. Mr. Milligan. Mr. McLaren. Mr. McLaren. The ayes being 62 and the nays being 28, I declare the motion carried. Mr. Garrison has moved second reading of Bill 83, an act to amend the Courts of Justice Act, the Libel and Slander Act, and the Statutory Powers Procedure Act in order to protect expression of the matters of public interest. Is it the pleasure of the House the motion carried? I heard a no. All those in favour say aye. aye. All those opposed say nay. nay. I, in my opinion, the ayes have it. Carried. I missed it again. Okay. Shall the bill be ordered for third reading? The, the Attorney General. Mr. Speaker, I would ask that the bill be referred to the Standing Committee on Social Policy. Makes sense. There are no further deferred votes. This House stands recess until Thursday. Right? Yeah, Thursday, uh, April 17th at 9 a.m.